So this morning, second Sunday of Advent, um, I want to start this morning with one of our scripture readings, and I think we'll read it together if that's okay. Is it going to be up here, Isaiah 11, 1 through 6? Yep. Okay, why don't we read that together? And if my voice drops out, that's because I've got a different version than you. A shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse, a branch which will sprout from his roots. The Lord's spirit will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of planning and strength, a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He won't judge by appearances nor decide by hearsay. He will judge the needy with righteousness and decide with equity for those who suffer in the land. He will strike the violent with the rod of his mouth, and by the breath of his lips he will kill the wicked. Righteousness will be the belt around his hips, and faithfulness the belt around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion will feed together, and a little child shall lead them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So here we are at the second Sunday of Advent, and you might have missed the first Sunday because it often happens on Thanksgiving weekend, and uh, some of us are traveling. Um, and so our focus for this next four weeks as we approach Christmas Eve is waiting in wonder. And if you did miss last week, I hope that uh, you were able to or will watch it on YouTube or Facebook because Jared gave us a very inspiring sermon on the four different kinds of waiting. And he uplifted Paul Tillich's admonition that waiting has us in the grasp of that for which we wait. Waiting has us in the grasp of that for which we wait. So on the second Sunday of Advent, our focus is on peace. And like the different kinds of waiting that we explored last week, there are also different kinds of peace. There's the peace we feel at the culmination of a journey or a project that has ended successfully, say, when all is calm and bright, the picture that's painted for us by the famous Christmas carol, Silent Night. There's the peace we feel when we're free from anxiety because everything is going the way we planned or the way we had hoped it would. There's the peace that comes when the things which disturb the peace have stopped. The baby stops crying, the dog stops barking, the neighbors turn off their too loud music, the traffic calms down to a light buzz, or the shelling stops, or the bullets stop or the sound of destruction and death stop. There's the peace that comes when an enemy is vanquished, peace that comes as a result of conflict or fighting ending because the source of conflict has been removed or beaten, usually by force and with violence. And so we use all these different words, peace, for different, excuse me, the same word, peace, for these different kinds of experiences. So as I was doing some research, I began to read about different Christmas traditions across the world, and I came across this centuries-old traditional ceremony called Declaring the Christmas Peace. And I thought, this is probably a really lovely sort of launch into the holiday. And we've got a picture of it, a slide of it. Um, at a time which began, especially back when the focus in societies was more on faith and resting from our labors for a day and not on commercialism. And so in the tradition of Christmas peace, which has been an integral part of Swedish and Finnish tradition since the late 13th century, so this is seven, eight centuries, the declaration of Christmas peace is announced uh, on Christmas Eve. And so you see a beautiful picture here um, of, of everyone coming together for this centuries-old tradition. The oldest and most popular event is held at noon on Christmas Eve day at the Old Great Square in the former Finnish capital of Turku, and that's what you're seeing here, um, where it's been read every year. Every year, with the exception of a few wartime years, since the 1320s. 
Music later on became a part of this event, and the current format of this ceremony starts with the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, our Protestant anthem. <laughs> and then it's followed by the declaration, which is announced by a city official who's all dressed up in a historic uniform. The declaration is read in Finnish and then again in Swedish, then everyone who's gathered sings the Finnish national anthem in both languages. After they sing it once in Finnish, they sing it again in Swedish. So here's the English translation of the Declaration of Christmas Peace. Tomorrow, God willing, is the graceful celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior. And thus is declared in the land a peaceful Christmas time to all by advising devotion and to behave otherwise quietly and peacefully. Because he who breaks this peace and violates the peace of Christmas by any illegal or improper behavior shall under aggravating circumstances be guilty and punished <laughs> according to what the law and statutes prescribe for each and every offense separately. Finally, a joyous Christmas feast is wished to all the inhabitants of the city. So after I saw this beautiful romantic Christmas scene, I, I was a little taken aback when I read what the Christmas peace really is. Now that declares a different kind of peace than what I was expecting. <laughs> I was looking more for like peace on earth or the peace of Christ or the peace that passes understanding, uh, not a warning from authorities to behave yourself. And if you don't, <laughs> <laughs> the crimes that you commit on Christmas Day will be punished more harshly than on any other day. And by the way, have a joyous Christmas feast. <laughs> so the peace that we seek at Christmas is a peace which does not come from a declaration of the assurance of punishment <laughs> if we don't behave. The peace of Christ is very different. Matthew's gospel shares that as Jesus was beginning his public ministry... His cousin John began to proclaim a special kind of active waiting for us to prepare for the coming of the Prince of Peace. An active waiting that involved preparation and devotion and expectation. So hear the words of the gospel from Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist started preaching in the desert of Judea and he said, turn back to God. The kingdom of heaven will soon be here. John was the one prophet Isaiah was talking about when he said, In the desert, someone is shouting, Get the road ready for the Lord. Make a straight path for him. So John wore clothes of camel's hair. He had a leather strap around his waist, and he ate grasshoppers and wild honey. From Jerusalem and all Judea and from the Jordan River Valley, crowds of people came out to hear John and see him. And they told him how sorry they were for their sins. And then he baptized them in the river. So John the baptizer came to invite the people into a kind of waiting that was not passive, but very pro. It was proactive, pro-change, and pro-preparation. John's fiery, aggressive approach of preparing may not seem to be very well related to our understanding of the term waiting. So I want us to look into that a little bit. The Oxford English Dictionary explores the roots of this word that we have now, wait. To wait from the Indo-European root means to be strong, to be lively. The Middle English that comes from the Old Northern French for wait includes all forms of wake. Wait and wake come from the same root, as in lie and wait for, observe carefully, be watchful. Wake and wait both relate to the development of our current word to prepare, which means to make ready beforehand for some purpose or use or activity, to put yourself in a proper state of mind. And so from the same root that we get the words wait and wake come these other words that we have today, like surveillance, reveille, vigilant, bivouac, velocity, vigor, watch, awaken, and arise. So the kind of waiting that we're called to do throughout Advent is active, awakened, preparing kinds of waiting, awaking up from our collective slumber, 
that lulls us to the cry of the suffering, awakening against a pervasive apathy that grows patient with crooked roads and crooked people and societies that tolerate poverty and oppression and break all the forms of shalom by accepting it as the way of the world. John, the baptizer, makes way for the Prince of Peace with very clear and assertive directions. He says, wake up. Wake up to your issues. Wake up to your shortcomings. Wake up to the ways that you ignore and work around and procrastinate on engaging the law of love in your everyday life. And repent, another word we don't like. <laughs> <laughs> because that word is loaded in current culture. But back when he used it, and when Jesus used it, it was not loaded. It was just a translation of the Greek metanoia. And metanoia means to have a transformative change of heart, to think above your current thinking, to experience a spiritual awakening. So there's that awakening idea again. So the peace for which we wait to awaken and prepare is not the peace that comes from vanquishing. It's not the peace that comes from punishing the rabble-rouser who disturbs the peace. The peace for which we're preparing is true shalom. The peace that comes when everyday life is marked by joy, by creativity, dignity, freedom, abundance, and harmony. When all of creation is free to become what it was originally created to be, to live in beauty and grace, the peace we seek is a peace that passes our understanding because we haven't seen it yet on earth, except for brief and shining moments until it's broken again by the effects of a broken world. And yet, even though we flounder still in patterns of brokenness while we prepare for the Prince of Peace, there are glimpses of peace in our everyday lives. Sometimes we are truly sustained by the inner contact we can make with a lasting peace that is real, a peace that does exist eternally in divine realms, a peace which is constantly seeking places on earth and in human hearts to break through silver linings in the darkest night, deep pools of calm in the darkest storm. I shared with you previously that my favorite hymn is, I'm going to talk about it here, <laughs> in the 19th century, one of America's greatest poets, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, wrote a poem about a Christmas Day experience which sprung from his despairing heart in the lo uh, loss of deep despair. He lost his wife to disease, and he lost his son to a Civil War combat wound. Already, their society was decimated by death and violence. He felt completely hopeless, he felt faithless and lost, and he described how those feelings overwhelmed him on a bitter Christmas day, a day when he was not feeling the peace. And he wrote this poem, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, which is now a hymn, and here's how it goes. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, in music sweet the tones repeat. There's peace on earth, goodwill to men. But in despair I bowed my head. There's no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. So when we wait for the Prince of Peace, wait awakened with a prepared and active and aroused spirit, we can discern that things are changing. We grow stronger and more assured of things hoped for. We have deeper faith in the evidence of things not seen, and we can discern that peace itself is coming in the form of a child, and it's merging with us by engaging the human experience, by taking on a body, by being tempted as we are, facing fear and facing temptation, and finally, by creating an indestructible bridge between humanity and divinity, whereby we exist 
mystically and simultaneously in both realms. And this story, our faith story, our Christian faith story, is also a universal story. The same story is found outside Christian writings, and it's found in other cultures in different forms, but with the same message. Prepare the way. Things on earth are changing. Divinity is coming closer, so be awake. Be ready. I'll close today with a prayer written by Brian Doyle. Brian was a prolific and lauded novelist, an essayist, a poet, and an editor. And I think we have a slide of his book here. He wrote romping and real and radical verse, which spoke to the hearts of people all over the world. In fact, one critic said about Brian, he writes with joyful abandon, and his words are like kids rolling in the grass. <laughs> I love that image. Unfortunately, we lost him early. He died of a brain tumor in 2017 when he was only 60 years old. He was a devoted but often irrelevant Catholic, <laughs> and he was able to glimpse moments of awakeness, sometimes by actively trying, and sometimes simply through grace. But he was always looking for it. So this prayer is called A Muttered Prayer in Thanks for the Under Genius of Christmas by Brian Doyle. Putting up the fir tree last night and wondering again why we slay a perfectly healthy tree that's only 10 years old <laughs> and prop up the body and drape it with frippery, I watched my family quietly from behind the tree where I was struggling with that haunted, cursed string of lights. <laughs> and then I saw the under-genius of it all. I saw beneath the tinsel and the eggnog, the snarl of commerce and the ocean of misspent money. I saw the quiet pleasure of ritual, the actual no kidding, no fooling urge to pause and to think about other people and their joy, the anticipation of days spent laughing and shouldering in the kitchen with no agenda and no press of duty. I saw the flash of peace and love under all the shrill selling and the shallow tinny theater, and I was thrilled and moved. And then I remembered that the ostensible reason for it all was the love, the great love, the divine love, being bold and brave enough to assume a form that would bleed and break and despair and die. And I was again moved and abashed. And so I finished untangling the epic knot of lights, <laughs> shivering yet again with happiness that we were given such a sweet, terrible knot of a world to untangle as best we can with a bumbling love. And so I prayed, amen. Friends, as we continue our Advent journey, May you too see the under genius of Christ in all the little ways and the little things as you keep awake and prepare for the Prince of Peace to be more born in the manger of the human heart. Amen.